Hello, everyone. My name is Natalie Legere, and I'm a learning specialist with the Autism Learning Partnership, a branch of the New Brunswick Department of Education and Early Childhood Development. It's a pleasure for me to talk to you today about social skills and autism spectrum disorder. Today, we'll have a one hour presentation where we will discuss different topics related to social skills. At the end of the presentation, we will share our email address. So please feel free to send us our questions if they arise. Without further ado, let's get started. So the human being is by nature a social being. And every day we're presented with many opportunities for socializing, like talking at the lunch table, greeting the bus driver as you get on the bus, holding the door for someone, or making eye contact with the teacher who's explaining a concept in front of the class, and of course, many more. Our experiences help us learn a wide range of social skills and help us develop healthy and meaningful relationships. For most people, social skill competencies develop naturally. But for others, like people who have ASD, learning requires a more structured instruction. One of the fundamental characteristics of ASD is the presence of persistent deficits in communication and social interaction. Today's webinar will therefore focus on teaching social skills to individuals with autism spectrum disorder. This webinar has four main learning objectives. The first is to identify possible social skill deficits in individuals who have ASD. The second focuses on the importance of developing social skills especially with individuals with ASD. Then we'll share a tool to help us identify which social skills we should be prioritizing. And finally, we'll identify and explain approaches and strategies that are effective in teaching social skills to learners with ASD. It would be logical to begin by giving a definition of a social skill. But as it turns out, this is no easy task, in part because social skills represent several distinct skills that form a whole. Generally speaking, it can be defined as the ability to interact with others appropriately and effectively. A challenge with this definition is to determine what is considered appropriate and what is considered effective. And what is considered appropriate and effective in one social situation may not be appropriate and effective in another. The reality is challenging for individuals with ASD because in addition to having to develop a skill of some sort, he or she must also determine when and where it is appropriate to be used. This will be discussed in more detail during this presentation. It is also important to note that just because we have social skills, doesn't mean we have all the tools we need to interact appropriately and efficiently in all situations. The complexity of the repertoire of social skills require constant analysis of the environment to determine how to act in any given situation. All individuals with ASD have some form of persistent deficits in communication and social interaction. The degree of severity of the challenges will vary from individual to individual and may present differently from one person to the next. These deficits may be related to, among other things, reciprocal interaction, nonverbal communication required during social interactions, and maintaining social relationships. Let's look at each of these three components a little closer. Reciprocal interaction implies that communication is a two-way, back-and-forth process. In other words, communicating involves more than just saying words. One person shares ideas, needs, or desires, and the other person listens and then does the same. Several skills are needed to demonstrate socio-emotional reciprocity. Knowing when and how to initiate or respond to social interaction, sharing interests or discussing other person's interests, 
sharing emotions or recognizing the emotions of others, being able to understand the other person's point of view. These skills can be difficult to master for a learner with ASD. And this explains why reciprocal interaction may be absent. Without it, social interactions can be difficult. Nonverbal communication is any aspect of communication that is not verbalized. We communicate continuously through our gestures, facial expressions, and postures. And several skills are also necessary to communicate well through nonverbal language, like maintaining eye contact, recognizing the meaning of gestures and facial expressions, performing the same gestures or facial expressions in order to communicate with others. These skills can also be difficult to master for a learner with ASD. And this explains why nonverbal communication is sometimes awkward or absent. Poor nonverbal communication skills can also make social interactions difficult. Maintaining social relationships are at the top of the pyramid in terms of level of difficulty. There are dozens, even hundreds of skills involved in maintaining a social relationship, such as taking an interest in others, showing affection for others, waiting one's turn, sharing, apologizing, using humor appropriately, adjusting behavior to the social context. These skills are also difficult for individuals who have ASD. In the last few minutes, we mentioned more than a dozen examples of social skills that may be difficult for individuals with ASD, and there are many more. That's why social interaction is a challenge. We will discuss these three components in more detail a little later on. So how can we provide the support needed to help learners with ASD develop social skills? As we've seen, teaching social skills is a complex task due to the large number of variables present in even the most basic social skills. In fact, according to Justin B. Leaf, a well-known author in the field, the complexity of social skill instruction is one of the main reasons other areas such as language development, problem behavior, academic skills are often prioritized. In his published book about social skills in people with ASD, Leaf notes that teaching social skills is important, even critical, because as we can see on this slide, it encourages natural language development and allows for more peer interaction. It promotes friendship development, makes school more enjoyable, improves academic performances, and most importantly, it improves the quality of life. Saying that people with ASD are not sociable or do not want to socialize with their peers is a misconception about autism. Rather, it is a social skill deficit that results in social behaviors that is not always appropriate, which does not mean that that person with ASD does not want to socialize. Continued inappropriate social behavior can interfere with the development of relationships and lead to isolation, which can lead to feelings of loneliness, depression, and even suicidal thoughts. The potential risk of these negative consequences demonstrates the importance of teaching social skills to individuals with ASD. To summarize, teaching social skills is essential because it encourages the natural development of language, enables peer interaction, promotes the development of meaningful relationships, makes school enjoyable, and improves not only academic performance, but overall quality of life as well. As mentioned, teaching social skills is in itself a complex process, and the challenges faced by an individual with ASD increases the level of difficulty. Let's say a child with ASD wants to join a group of peers to play, but that this child has difficulty initiating conversation, maintaining eye contact, recognizing nonverbal language, 
and waiting for his turn to speak. So let's say his teen decides to start by teaching him how to initiate a conversation with others. The team can work with the child to teach different ways to initiate conversation with others, and there may be several opportunities for this child to practice. However, each social situation is unique. It is often necessary to adapt to the different contexts and conditions of a social situation, which is not easy, even for us adults. So it can be frustrating for the child and for the people around him or her to continually deal with all these particularities and to have to adjust accordingly. So in today's webinar, our aim is to give a better understanding of the social challenges faced by an individual with ASD and offer some ideas on how to help them. We recognize that this is a complex process that will take time, but we develop social skills throughout our lives. So it is expected that it will also be an ongoing process with our learners with ASD. Even if teaching social skills is recognized as necessary, given the level of complexity, it can be difficult to begin teaching. A question that often arises when teaching social skills is, where do I start? Here are four steps that we will explore further in the next few slides. First is the importance of prioritizing. We can't work on all social skills at the same time. But in order to prioritize, we first need to know the learner's current level of skills. And we must identify the skills that may be critical to their success. Once a priority has been targeted, it is important to formulate a learning objective that is specific, measurable, and observable in order to guide interventions and verify the learning process. Research shows that children with ASD learn best when structured interventions are used. Therefore, to promote the pace of learning, it is better to work towards a specific goal rather than a general one. Next, a strategy for teaching must be chosen. There are several evidence-based strategies and practices. There are strategies whose positive effects have been demonstrated and validated by research. An evidence-based strategy will be discussed later in this presentation. And finally, it is important to note that a competency is considered mastered only when it can be generalized across different contexts and with different people and maintained over time. It is not very useful or functional for children to be able to make eye contact only with their parents and only at their home. Nor is it very useful for a child to master a skill but to forget it over time. So ongoing support is essential to ensure that the skill is generalized and maintained. Let's take a closer look at each of the steps we've just talked about. To target a priority, it is important to be aware of the strengths and challenges of the individuals we're working with. This information can be obtained through direct observation or through interviews or discussions with people who work directly with the individual. Direct observation is always recommended because it allows you to see the individual's behavior with your own eyes. As educators or parents, you see the child or learner every day and probably have a good idea of their strengths and challenges. However, sometimes it is good to observe and record your observations in a more concrete and structured way. For example, a teacher may decide to go on the playground with a piece of paper and a pencil to record their observations. A parent could sit in the living room while their child with ASD is playing with a sibling and record their observations. It is important to observe the individual in different environments as they often have difficulty generalizing their skill from one setting to the next. A skill may be present at home, but not at school, for example. 
One can also ask others around the child or learner for additional information. This information is important and can provide interesting details, but is considered indirect information because it comes from another person who shares his or her opinion. For this reason, direct observation is always recommended. Certain skills may be considered essential. In other words, they contribute to the development of other skills or may be prerequisites to the development of other skills. Often, when not mastered, these essential skills cause significant blockages in terms of development of social skills. For example, if a learner is unable or has great challenges in approaching others, this may be an important skill to target first. The same is true for joint attention, the ability to coordinate one's attention with that of another person, such as directing one's gaze in the same direction as another person in order to see what the other person is interested in. It is all well and good to try to work on a more advanced skill, such as maintaining a conversation with others, but if the individual has difficulty approaching others and coordinating his or her attention with that of the other person, the efforts may not bear fruit. There are tools that assess social skills that present challenges for individuals with ASD. However, you may not have the tools or the training to do a comprehensive assessment, so we will share some of the tips to help you identify the skills that may be a priority to work on. As we mentioned earlier, when we want to identify a social skill priority, we must look at the learner's strengths and challenges. Identifying strengths help us identify skills that we can use to facilitate instruction. For example, if the learner can imitate in a play context, we can use this skill to help him or her develop simple social play skills. Identifying challenges allows us to target skills that are lacking. For example, if we say that one of the learner's challenges is, to, is their conversation level, we can then look more closely at the skills needed for conversation in order to try to determine which ones are deficient with that particular learner. Is it tolerating closeness to others, initiating the discussion, varying the topics of discussion, or maybe listening to others? When listing strengths and challenges in social skills, it is important to observe the learner while keeping in mind the purpose of the observation to ensure that the learner is paying close attention to his or her social skills. Sometimes it may even be necessary to create situations to see the learner's reaction. For example, a peer may be asked to invite the learner to play a game or to discuss a particular topic with the learner to see his or her reaction and to observe the game or the conversation. In addition, we have created a guide that will help you identify potential areas to work on with your learners. Using the guide to help think about what priorities we should be focusing on. It is also important to take the time to reflect on the big picture and ask questions that will help identify priorities and essential skills for the immediate future. For example, we could consider questions like what skill would enable the learner to become more involved in family or community activities? Or what skill would enable the learner to participate more with peers? Are there skills that would facilitate the learning of other skills if mastered? Uh, what skills would give the learner access to new environments or to new social activities or opportunities? Or what would facilitate social interaction for the learner? Also, whenever possible, it is important to include the learner when determining priorities. Ask the learner about his or her goals, objectives, and dreams. Next, ask yourself what skills do they need to achieve their goals. Perhaps the learner wants to play with someone on the playground or would like to join a club or an activity. 
They may even want to find a part-time job or invite a friend for a weekend outing. Next, think about the different social skills needed to achieve this goal in order to identify possible skill deficits that you could work on. Once the priority is targeted, it is important to formulate an objective that will allow the learner's progress to be assessed. We mentioned that it should be specific, observable, measurable, and attainable. The following is a brief definition of each of the components. Specific means that the objective is directly related to the skill being worked on and must be personalized to the learner's needs. For example, if Jamie does not react when his name is called, the specific objective could be Jamie will turn his head towards the person who called out his name. For Lucy, who has the same challenge, the specific objective could be Lucy will turn her head and make eye contact for at least two seconds with the person who said her name. Both objectives are specific and are adapted to each person's needs. Observable behavior is the action that can be observed on the part of the learner that tells us that he or she achieved the expected result such as saying that the learner approaches a peer or joins into a conversation. For example, if Nicholas has difficulty collaborating with others, we should find a way to describe the collaboration in a more observable way. The objective could be, during group work, Nicholas proposes to perform at least one task. Measurable means that the manifestation of the target behavior can be demonstrated with the help of data. For example, if Sophia has difficulty participating in conversations, it may be possible to observe the course of the conversation, but more difficult to measure the participation. However, if the following objective is used, for example, Sophia will make at least two comments and ask at least one question in a three to five minute conversation, it becomes possible to measure it. And finally, achievable simply means that the objective is achievable over time. For example, if Logan is a nonverbal learner and we want him to greet people, we could start with, Logan will be able to wave when he meets someone known as an attainable goal. Other fictitious examples of specific, observable, measurable, and attainable goals include the following. Mary initiates a conversation with a peer and sustains the conversation by making a comment or asking a question appropriate to the context for at least five out of five conversations. When Randy comes to class and is asked to wait his turn, he waits without protesting and responds when it is his turn on four out of five occasions. Here are examples that are considered counterexamples. Julian will be able to interact well with others. This is neither specific, observable, nor measurable. Another one, Julian will be able to wait his turn. This also is not specific enough, which makes it difficult to observe and to measure. Nicholas will be able to compliment others. This is neither specific nor measurable. Logan will be able to mimic his peers. This is another non-example. This is neither specific nor measurable. Let's take a moment to review. To target a priority, what must we do? A, B, C, or D? If you chose D, all of the above, you are correct. We need to identify strengths and challenges, conduct observation sessions or interviews, and identify essential skills to work with to be able to target a priority. We have now targeted a priority and identified a specific, measurable, observable, and achievable objective. But how can we ensure that we are using effective practices? Research shows that intervention based on applied behavioral analysis 
are effective in teaching social skills to learners with ASD. Specifically, modeling, video modeling, behavior skills instruction, prompting, reinforcement, discrete trial training, and peer-mediated instruction and interviews can be used. In this presentation, we will focus on behavior skills training. A second webinar on social skills will be offered later in the year to discuss additional teaching strategies. Behavioral skills training, or BST, is an evidence-based training approach consisting of multiple components, including four teaching techniques, instruction, modeling, practice, and feedback. It is a teaching strategy that allows the individual to see an example of what is expected and to practice while the teacher provides valuable feedback. Research shows that a person is more likely to be able to correctly perform an expected behavior when they have the opportunity to see an example and to practice. Often, when people want to teach a new skill, they give instructions or explanations. For example, we may say to a child, it's very important to respect the personal space of others around you. So when you interact with others, make sure you stay at an acceptable distance away from them. Do you understand? The child could verbally confirm that they understood the instruction, but the adult cannot confirm that the child has actually understood. However, by adding modeling and practice exercises, the adult can see the child in action and confirm that the child has understood the expectations. This is an effective teaching strategy for teaching both children and adults. Most importantly, BST can be tailored to the individual's needs. At the beginning of BST, the adult provides oral or written instruction to the learner. These instructions explain in detail the targeted behavior or sequences and the context in which it should occur. The second step in BST is modeling, which can be done by the teacher or by others, live or via video. The model demonstrates each component and steps necessary to successfully complete the competency. Following the modeling, the learner has the opportunity to practice. In a role play situation or in a more usual context, the learner can practice the skill taught under supervision and guidance of the teacher. And finally, the teacher must ensure that feedback is given to the learner to highlight his or her strengths and provide reinforcement and help the learner overcome challenges, if any. When the learner encounters challenges, the teacher may revisit some of the instructions or further the modeling and the practice opportunities until the learner can perform the competency fluently and without prompting to bring them to mastery. It is in this way that the BST method is personalized to the needs of each individual since it allows the learner to return to the previous steps to perfect the skill being worked on. BST often takes place in a structured context so it is important to plan for generalization as practicing the skill in different contexts, places, and with different people. Finally, in order to ensure that the competency is maintained over time and generalized in a variety of contexts, it is important to continue to observe and to do ongoing coaching, especially in the learner's usual environment, because feedback should be um, followed by observation periods as soon as possible. So let's review. What does BST stand for? If you chose C, behavioral skills training, you have the right answer. In what order do BST steps happen? If you chose B, instruction, modeling, practice, and feedback, you have the correct answer. Let's take a closer look at each of the steps in the BST model. In the first step, the adult describes a skill, its importance or its purpose, and when to use it or when not to use it. Justifying the importance of the competency is an important step because when the learner understands the reason behind the competency, 
it becomes more meaningful to him or her. Let's take the example of respecting the personal space of others. For the learner with ASD, it is likely that they do not see the importance or relevance of the competency. It is therefore important to explain it, adapting our vocabulary to the learner's level of language and comprehension. We could say that others don't like it when we stand too close to them. Or we could explain the one-arm rule, where we should always be able to keep one arm's length between us and the other person. Depending on the learner's age, we can vary the explanation and make connections with their reality. Instructions can be given orally, in writing, or both at the same time. It is also possible to repeat the instruction or return to them after modeling and uh, practice if it is necessary. Let's look at another example. Shauna teaches David to greet people he knows. She says, when you see someone you know, you can greet them by saying hello or good morning. It is appropriate to say hello to people you meet at school or in your neighborhood. When you greet a friend at school, wait until you have their attention. If that person is busy or talking to someone else, it's not a good time to say hello. Shauna also explains to David that you greet people because you're happy to see them or because you want to be friendly or polite. She also gives him examples of when you shouldn't greet people, such as greeting the same person in class every time they look at you. She explains that greeting people repeatedly can irritate them. Shauna could prepare a visual support to summarize the instructions. It is important to remember that instructions must be given in a language that the learner can understand. Therefore, the receptive language skills of the learner must be taken into account. In addition, make sure you have the learner's attention before giving instructions. The second stage of BST is to model the skill to the learner. In other words, the adult will give an example while the learner observes. Modeling can be done in person, or by video modeling, in which case the adult would film a short video of people adopting the correct behavior beforehand in order to view the video with the learner later on. For example, Shauna could tell David that she's going to show him how to greet people. She would say to him, I'm going to leave the room, come back in again, and pretend I'm seeing you for the first time. Shauna could then come back in the room and say, Hello, David. Shauna and David could then walk around the school and Shauna could say, to hello, could say hello to people she meets along the way to show David what the skill looks like. The modeling step helps link the competency to the image of what it actually looks like. This step also prevents the adult from assuming that the learner has understood and can perform the skill after simply receiving an oral instruction. As mentioned earlier, when someone is asked if they understood the instructions, they often respond yes, but this could mean several things. They may have understood the instruction, but they may not be able to actually do it. For example, the learner may have understood what it, what it means to greet people and when it's appropriate to do so, but may not be able to demonstrate this competency. They may not have understood the instruction, but claim to have understood it either because they are afraid of being judged or misunderstood, or because they simply do not want to hear more explanations, or for other reasons. It is also possible that the person answers yes because they honestly believe that they have understood, but that this is not actually the case. And it's possible that, despite our best efforts, the instructions we gave were not clear. Good modeling includes an exact and specific example of what we are looking for, a narration, if appropriate, of the steps during the modeling. In other words, the adult can explain what they're doing while they're doing it. It also includes an example of what not to do, if this is appropriate for the learner. Several examples illustrating the skill in different contexts should also be given. And finally, a discussion, if appropriate, with the learner to validate their observations. 
During BST, which of the following answers are correct as they relate to the instructions? A, B, C, or D? If you chose D, you are correct. The instructions can be given verbally or in written form or both. Modeling must always happen in person. Is this true or false? If you chose false, you're correct because modeling can also happen through video modeling. The third step in the BST model is to practice. It is in this step that we create situations in which the learner can practice the skill that is being targeted. The adult can encourage the child and provide help if necessary in the form of physical, gestural, or verbal prompting, visual incentives such as pictures and photos, or even textual prompts like written words. If we go back to our example, this is where David would practice greeting people. Since David is at the very beginning of this learning process, Shauna could help him by nodding yes when it's appropriate for David to greet someone. It is important for the adult to organize the environment during this practice session. To do so, Shauna could invite one or two people to come into the class to give David the opportunity to practice greeting them. She could also plan a short walk in the school, high, uh, school hallway so David could practice greeting them when he meets them. Depending on David's needs, it may be necessary to start with a more structured practice, like going to the school reception to greet the receptionist, and then move on to a less structured, more complex exercise, such as greeting people during the break. In addition to the benefits of practicing, Structured opportunities also give the learner a chance to experience being successful. If Shauna knows that David gets nervous when there are too many people around, she can first allow David to practice with one or two people. If Shauna knows that David enjoys interacting with a particular person in the school, she might ask that person to participate in a practice session to motivate David. This step should be individualized to the learner's needs and it should promote success. During practice, it is important that the adult record information about the learner's correct and incorrect responses. This allows the adult to monitor the learner's progress and determine, using the data, when the learner can begin to loosen the supports and when the learner can perform the skill independently. Finally, another important aspect to remember about the practice stage is that it is essential. Remember that it is through practice that great professionals of the sports world advance in their level of performance. Their talent has not only been developed because they have been told what to do and they have watched a few videos, but several hours of practice accompanied the instruction and the modeling to make them competent. The same goes for the development of social skills. Practice must be accompanied by feedback. This step informs the learner about what they have done well and what they could improve on. When giving feedback, it is suggested that you adopt the sandwich method, first highlighting strengths, listing one or two challenges, and then ending with another strength. When sharing observations about the strengths and challenges, it is important to support them with concrete examples of performance. This is also an ideal time to offer more guidance further modeling or other opportunities for practice follow by further feedback. For example, during a practice exercise, Shauna could offer the following feedback to David. Good job! I'm very proud of you. You made eye contact very well before greeting Mr. Dawson. Your greeting was excellent. Next time, I would like you to keep walking after you greet him. You saw that Mr. Dawson was leaving for his class and didn't have time to talk. Sometimes people are busy and they just have time to say hello, but I'm really proud of you because you smiled and waved, and I'm sure Mr. Dawson is proud of you too. So next time, we'll try to remember to keep walking after we greet the person. In this example, Shauna highlights the good points and also gives David clear feedback. He knows what he needs to improve on, and he knows what he did well. Shauna should allow him to continue the practice exercise until she feels David has mastered his specific 
and important aspects of the targeted behavior. It is important to allow the learner to practice in different places, with different people, and in different contexts. Because as we mentioned, teaching social skills is a complex process because the individual must be able to adjust to different situations. BST allows the individual to practice in different situations to increase the chances that the skill will be generalized and maintained over time. Therefore, Shauna should repeat the practical exercises over several days with different people and in different places. The following video provides a model of the steps that are included in the behavioral skills training model. As a side note, the children you'll see in this video are child actors. Okay, Maeva, so what we're going to do today, I'm going to show you how to approach a group of friends when they're playing so that you can join what they're doing and play with them. Because I've noticed that sometimes you just stay beside them and you don't really know what to say to join their group and you just play by yourself beside. So it's sure that when you want to join friends, you want to ask politely so that they want you to come play with them and that you don't just jump in their game because then they might not want you to play with them. So what we're going to do, I'm going to go see your friends and I'm going to ask them to play with them while they're already playing. And then you'll practice it. And to help you out, I prepared little cards. If I see that you're not sure what to say, I'll show you the card and you can just read it off. Okay? Okay. So you saw what I did. I just went to see the, your friends and I asked them politely if I could join what they were doing, what they were playing. And um, now it's going to be your turn. So what we're going to do, I'll have my little cards to help you. If you don't know what to say, you can just read off of them in order to join their game. Maeva, that was really good. You excused yourself and you asked politely to join what they were doing. And I think that the only thing that was missing is next time, once you start playing with them, you can continue talking to them and invent a game and go ahead with that. Like, here, follow me with the colors. So you can keep on talking while you're playing. Okay. Okay. When should the learner get the opportunity to practice? When they didn't understand? Following modeling? Following modeling and as many times as necessary? 
when the skill is not demonstrated in the natural environment or when time allows. If you chose C, you have the right answer. Which of the following feedback is the best, A, B, or C? If you chose A, you are correct. This answer incorporates the sandwich concept we were speaking of earlier. It gives positive feedback, names something that we can improve on, and then follows with another positive uh, comment. If you were tempted to choose C, it's not incorrect, but it's incomplete. There's no concrete examples of what we can do to get better. Let's take a closer look at how we can plan for maintenance and generalization. When a competency is taught using the BST model in a structured environment, it is important to assess whether the child adopts the same competency in the environment where it would normally take place. In other words, when the learner ha has had a chance to practice, is he or she able to demonstrate the skill without support in a real life situation? In situ or on-site assessments occur when a learner's skills are assessed in the usual environment in a time when the learner is unaware that an assessment is taking place. In other words, during a day-to-day -day situation, the child is observed without being aware of it. It would be preferable that a different person than the person who has been teaching the concept does the observation so that his present doesn't influence the learner's behavior. For example, Shauna could ask another teacher to observe David. As a parent, you could ask another family member to observe your child. If you do an on-site assessment and the learner behaves as they do in the natural environment, well, well done. This means that they have generalized their learning well. It does not mean, however, that you should stop observing the learner. In order to assure that the competency is maintained over time, it is important to plan for observations to validate if the competency is being maintained. If you notice that the learner no longer demonstrates the competency after a period of time, it may be necessary to return to the BSC step. If you are doing an in situ assessment and the learner does not demonstrate the target behavior in the usual environment, in situ teaching will be required to promote generalization and maintenance. In other words, the competency is taught using BST in the natural environment when the situation and context are conducive to the behavior. Consider the example of David. Shauna has taught in a variety of structured environments. She organized the environment to support David's success by giving specific feedback and by inviting people to come to the room and arranging the interactions with Mr. Dawson she also planned for a visit to the school reception. So if David has difficulty generalizing his learning, Shauna will need to continue teaching, but instead of creating learning opportunities, she will need to take advantage of the natural opportunities that arise in David's everyday days. For example, during the break, when students are walking in the hallway, Shauna could take advantage of the opportunity to do a practical exercise. In situ teaching is more complex because the adult cannot predict conditions or events. Shauna will not be able to predict who David will meet in the hallway and he, we will have to adjust quickly. In situ or in the moment teaching is more complex but sometimes works better for some learners who have difficulty generalizing their learning. Now let's look at some factors that could contribute to the success of the intervention. During our very first webinar, a recording which is available on our website, we talked about ABA and the importance of considering environmental variables that precede and follow the behavior. In the following diagram, A represents the antecedent, which occurs immediately before the behavior. The antecedent doesn't directly cause the behavior, but establishes conditions that are favorable to it. An antecedent can be anything that exists or occurs in the environment, including a verbal instruction, the presence of a person, a toy or object, or any other stimulus such as light and sound. B represents the behavior that's being measured. And C stands for the consequence, or what happens immediately after the behavior. It is the consequence that determines whether the behavior will be more likely to occur in the future, or, on the contrary, will be less likely to occur. 
When we try to see a certain behavior in a child or a learner, we must ask ourselves what variables occur before the behavior and what variables occur after the behavior. Here are a few tips to create conditions conducive to learning new social skills. First off, is the learning environment appropriate or should it be modified? Does the child learn well in an environment where there is some noise in action or would a quiet, calm environment be better? Or can he or she learn in the usual environment, such as the playground or cafeteria? Is the child easily distracted by objects? Should certain objects be removed to limit distractions? And would the child need supports, such as visual aids, timers, or other aids to help him learn? Finally, we must consider the child's motivation. Some will be naturally motivated because they want to interact with others, and this desire may be enough to increase the motivation to learn, and others may not, and will need to look at reinforcing consequences to encourage the targeted social behavior. Regarding the consequence to a behavior, it can be either reinforcing or punishing. Reinforcing consequences result in maintaining or increasing the frequency of the behavior, while punishing results in decreasing the future frequency of the behavior. It is important to note that we are looking at the effect of the consequence on the behavior. It is this effect that determines whether it is reinforcing or punishing, not our perception of the level of desirability of the consequence. For example, a teacher or parent may consider a reprimand to be a punishing consequence. But if the behavior is maintained and even increases over time despite the reprimand, it was acting as reinforcement. A quick note on motivation. If an individual is not motivated to interact with others, the naturally occurring consequence of accessing social interaction won't be enough to sustain his motivation through the learning process, and a more tangible item or activity should be considered and paired with the social reinforcement. So, if the skill is to increase frequency of eye contact, for example, the skill could be taught using preferred items or activities as reinforcement. Offering social reinforcement along with more tangible reinforcement will help to increase the value of the social reinforcement. So controlling the antecedent simply means structuring the environment in a way that improves learning conditions. Examples of antecedent can include identifying the learner's interests and preferences to gain their motivation, providing an environment that is conducive to learning, and providing social supports as needed. Delivering a reinforcing consequence means offering a desirable consequence following a target behavior. If we want a child to increase the frequency of him or her asking questions or making comments, we could give praise or offer a preferred item or activity when the desired behavior is displayed. Reinforcing consequences express the idea that people integrate behaviors that work and learn from their experiences. True or false, it is not necessary to consider antecedents when teaching social skills because it is the consequences that are the most important. If you chose false, you are correct. The consequences are very important because they determine the likelihood that the behavior will occur again in the future. However, it is important to also consider the antecedents as they can help prevent the behavior in the first place and they promote learning. In this webinar, we talked about the importance of teaching social skills to learners with ASD, and we wanted to provide you with tips and strategies for teaching these skills, such as identifying teaching priorities, defining the target behaviors so they're observable and measurable, and we also presented teaching strategies, including the behavioral skills training, which includes giving instruction, modeling, practicing, and getting feedback. This strategy works for a wide variety of skills, including social skills. It is a strategy that can be done at school, at home, and in the community. But it is important to follow the four steps and to consider the impact of antecedents and consequences when teaching social skills.
Thank you for your interest towards this important topic. If you have any questions, please send them our way via the email that's provided on this slide. And feel free to consult our website for additional information and other resources.